Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about building an insect collection. Um, I'm working on this very traditional sort of teaching insect collection, so I'm not collecting multiples of everything. Um, I'm really just looking to collect representative specimens so that I can use them for several classes that I teach throughout the year. Um, this is a relatively new hobby for me, and I've, I'm learning a lot, <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the basic equipment that you need and where you can find it if you're interested in starting an insect collection of your own. First and foremost, you're going to need a net. Um, this is a really nice collapsible net. The handle gets longer, gets shorter. Um, it's got a nice uh, fine mesh to it and it's got a long tail, so I can really swish this thing around and catch a lot of different insects. You're also gonna need what's called a killing jar. You can actually make your own, but they do sell these commercially, and what it is, it's just a plastic container, and it's got this plaster insert. And what's important about this plaster insert is that this is what we're gonna put our ethyl acetate on. You can also use nail polish remover to kill your specimens, but I like using ethyl acetate because it's a lot faster and more humane. Keep in mind, we are killing something, so it's important to be very humane about it and respectful. Ethyl acetate is cheap, it's easy to use, and what we do with that is we charge this plaster piece of the killing jar. And I usually just tip it up, let it sit for a few seconds and get absorbed. And now there's ethyl acetate on that plaster. And you want to keep that in there because it's going to gas off. And now you have your killing jar ready to go. You can put a little bit in a smaller container, especially if you're out in the field collecting. You don't want to lug this around all day in a backpack. Um, so you can use little containers kind of like this. Speaking of containers, you're going to need something to put your bugs in. Once they've been successfully killed, in the killing jar, you want to keep collecting specimens throughout the day. So usually I bring a Tupperware, or this is just a mason jar, and you can see here's some specimens I collected earlier today, and once they're dead they can come into here for storage until I'm ready to take them home and put them in the freezer, which is what you want to do until you're ready to pin them. I usually like having an assortment of different size containers. Um, you know, like these little makeup jars or even just vials. It's nice to be able to sort things and keep them yeah. separate. For special things like butterflies or dragonflies, it's a good idea to have some paper envelopes to slip them into. That way the wings don't get damaged while you're transporting them. This butterfly is pinned on a spreading board. This is a special piece of equipment that works great for larger dragonflies and for any of the lepidopterans like moths and butterflies because they can get the thorax down in the gap and then the wings are held correctly in position by these strips of paper and pins until they're dry. So this is a very important tool if you're interested in collecting moths and butterflies and it works great on dragonflies as well. For most other insects, a variety of different styrofoam or um, pinning boards are a good idea. I have just a box full of this styrofoam packaging material and it works great. Um, just something to pin the bugs to until they dry out. Now, once they're pinned, I usually let them sit for about a week indoors where it's not humid and where it's climate controlled. And everything I've pinned, the legs, the antenna, the wings, will kind of harden and dry into place so that I can remove the extra pins and then my specimen is ready to display. It's also a good idea to have some sort of hand lens and a pair of tweezers. You're gonna be manipulating some very small body parts into position and it's a good idea to have both of these so you can take a closer look, you can move things around or pick up a leg or an antenna if it fell off, um, and then use clear nail polish to actually tack them back on. So don't worry if your bugs don't turn out perfect. You can practice and get really good at gluing them back together with clear nail polish. You're going to want a variety of different insect pins too and it's important not to use just sewing pins. Uh, these are stainless steel. You're going to want a variety of insect pins as well. It's important not to use sewing pins, but use actual insect pins because these will not rust. They're made out of stainless steel. They come in different gauges, so I like having some thicker ones and some thinner ones. That way I have options based on the size of the insect that I'm pinning. 
So when you're collecting, you can really collect just about anywhere. We're in the native plant garden of the botanical gardens here in New Orleans right now. Um, I've also collected in a variety of parks or just in my backyard at home. Usually when I'm collecting, I just have my killing jar in one hand and my net in the other hand. I'll set my killing jar down somewhere where I can find it. And then I kind of step back and look at what's there. And this is where your powers of eyesight come in handy, your powers of observation. And it's a good idea to just sort of see what's in the area before you start catching. like this is a long-tailed skipper and it's in pretty good shape so we're gonna keep it and usually what I do is I kind of crouch down I've got my net pinched off so it can't go anywhere and then I'm gonna take the bottom part of the killing jar and feed it up into the net that way if you know I, I lose my grip or this guy tries to take off, still within the net. Okay. And then I come in with the lid. Pull that back. And then I close it tight, because we want that ethyl acetate to work quickly and to kill the specimen you know, as humanely as possible. And you can see it's already starting to work. It takes about a minute. So for some things, you don't even need a net. Um, you can kind of knock them off into your killing jar. And here's a, a stink bug back here. We're going to collect him. Let's see if we can get it. Yep. And you see that skipper we just caught? It's already knocked out. It's very quick. But those are two different collecting methods that you can use. Usually after I'm done collecting, I'll put all my specimens in their containers in the freezer at home until I have enough to really sit and spend time and pin them correctly. This is not something you want to be rushed doing. It's something you really want to be intentional about. And we're going to include this publication in the resources page. This is from Ohio State Uni or Oregon State University, and it shows the location of where each pin should go in the thorax of the different orders and families of insects. This is really um, helpful because there is a proper way to pin. There is an accepted way to pin each thing um, that's global and universal um, for proper collecting. One of the most important parts of collecting is labeling your specimens, though. An insect specimen without a label that shows where it was collected, who it was collected by, and the date of collection is scientifically worthless. Um, let that be a lesson. I have some unlabeled things in here, but I have those tags written in my notebook. I have a field notebook. But if you notice, most specimens have a GPS address, my name and where I collected it, and the date of collection. That way, if I donate this collection later on in my life, scientists and other researchers can use it to see what was in certain areas at what time of the year, and then there's a whole lot of valuable information along with that specimen itself. We're going to pin this little beetle. This is a coleopteran that I collected a few days ago. And based on our publication here, we're going to put a pin right through the right shoulder of the thorax of this beetle. That's the proper place for that pin to go. And this is a fairly small specimen. So I'm going to choose a narrower gauge pin to do this. And you just gently poke it straight down at a 90 degree angle until it's on the pin, like so. I'm going to stick it back to my styrofoam, and then we're going to articulate the legs and the antenna so that they're in the proper position. And I have a variety of just these common number one pins to do that work with. Usually when it is the, the specimen pin itself, the one that's going to stay with that insect for the rest of its life, 
as a specimen, um, I choose a stainless steel, a little nicer pin, but these are nice utilitarian pins here. So we're gonna move the legs into position so that it's in a very natural pose. And sometimes the legs don't wanna stay and that's when you'd leave a pin in them. And you might need more than one pin for each leg or each wing, whatever it is you're trying to pin. And that's perfectly fine too. It's better to have more pins than not enough pins. Sometimes you can use two pins, almost like a pair of tweezers, to articulate the legs and set them. So you see how I've got half of the legs set. Let's do the other half. Okay. And this just takes practice. Um, I've been at this for about a year now. And trust me, my first specimens did not come out great. So don't be afraid to practice, practice, practice. You know, don't practice on your super special things that you've collected. Um, but some of the more common things that are easy to find collect a few of them and give it a try, and that's a good way to learn. Okay. Those wings all together, and see this leg moved out of position. As you manipulate them, you might have to go back and make some, some readjustments. And that's perfectly fine. Okay. And now that beetle is pinned, and we'll leave them like this in a nice safe location until they've dried out. Once they have dried out for about a week, you can carefully remove all those extra pins and then pick the specimen up and store them in a box. Now this is just what's called a field box. This is where I put things that I still need to print labels for, still need to classify and name, and it keeps them safe. What this is, is it's an airtight box when it's closed, and there's actually mites that'll get in and eat your specimens, and this is a nice cedar box that keeps those out. So it's, it's worth investing in the right equipment. This is called a field box. Now for displaying your collection, you want what's called a display box. And this is the same thing. It's got an airtight lid. It's got a nice glass top. And what it does is it seals your specimens inside so that they're safe from those mites. And it's got a nice styrofoam bottom to it as well. And you want to keep these boxes out of direct sunlight. You can have them out in your house. It's best to lay them flat. And you can actually get some repellent to put in the corners to keep these collections safe for the long term. Um, it's worth, in, if you're going to invest all that time and energy into pinning your specimens, labeling your specimens, naming your specimens, you want to take care of them so they last a long time. Properly cared for collections like this can last several hundred years. Um, it's best to have them indoors where there's not a lot of temperature fluctuations. And ideally, they would be in some sort of cold storage system, but they're perfectly fine to have out as long as you have the proper storage box.